And as I think pretty much everyone knows here, the problem with medicine is that we're still operating as if it's the 20th century. And in fact, standard of care medicine is still thinking it's the 20th century. I had an amazing email just a few days ago from a group in Australia, dealing they're dealing with the national healthcare system in Australia. And the national healthcare system refuses to believe that mold and mycotoxins have anything to do with any illness. That's it. Don't, don't confuse us with the data. They just want to ignore it and say, don't evaluate it. Don't treat it. There's nothing to do. It doesn't have anything to do with health. So wait a minute. What about all these people who are having all these problems? Well, we don't know what's causing that. Well, wait a minute. <laughs> what about when we treat for these problems and they get better? Yeah, that doesn't have anything to do with it. So it's amazing to me that medicine has is, is been stuck back in the 20th century. Now, in the 20th century, we were really successful with simple illnesses. If you have pneumococcal pneumonia, yes, uh, there's a contribution if you've got alcohol on board, if you have diabetes mellitus, if your B cells aren't performing well, for example, if you have multiple myeloma, all these things are contributors. But fortunately for physicians trying to treat it, the pneumococcus itself, the strep pneumoniae, was so much more important of a contributor than all the other contributors that we as physicians could get away with simply writing that prescription and focusing on that one problem. Now, that's great for pneumococcal pneumonia, but now we are virtually all dying of complex chronic illnesses that are fundamentally different. And so we're dying of things like cardiovascular disease and uh, Alzheimer's disease and cancers and things like that. Now, if you look at Alzheimer's and other neurodegenerative diseases have a similar idea here, there are multiple contributors. When you come to Alzheimer's disease, insulin resistance, as I'll show you in just a moment, critical player here, multiple different pathogens. The neuropathologists have shown us in the brains of patients with Alzheimer's, what do you find? You find P. gingivalis, from the oral microbiome. You find candida, you find herpes simplex, you find HHV6A and on and on and on. So these pathogens gain access to the brain and your brain makes the amyloid to try to kill them. It is an antimicrobial, but it is causing also downsizing of the network. Very much like what we saw with our country when the pandemic came, of course, we were all told shelter in place, pull back, protect yourself, don't go to work. And of course, the country went into a recession. Your brain is doing the same thing. You have these various insults, you make the amyloid to fight the insults, and you're pulling back. You're saying, I can't maintain these 500 trillion synapses that a human brain has, but I'm going to fight them and go into a protective downsizing mode. And unfortunately, if we don't identify the insults, you just keep downsizing, downsizing, downsizing until you die of Alzheimer's disease. So pathogens, critical, NF-kappa B, anything that is inflammation related, mercury, another cr critical contributor, mycotoxins, as I just showed you with that patient, organic toxins, uh, homocysteine, so methylation issues, detox issues, on and on and on, and there are many more of these. The problem, as you can see here, is there's not one single one that you just say, oh, I write a prescription for that one thing and it's gone. It's not a simple illness. It's a network dysfunction, which is why we need to take a network sort of approach or functional medicine or precision medicine sort of approach, identifying and treating. Therefore, this is the area of greatest biomedical therapeutic failure. You look at drug after drug after drug after drug. And I think the 11 on the expert FDA panel would all argue, as they did, that in fact, aducanumab should not have been improved because it is not an effective drug. And unfortunately, it has multiple side effects micro hemorrhages in the brain, cerebral edema in 40% of people, and unfortunately death uh, in one of the recent patients. So here's the problem. The current standard of care has not kept up with the research. So when you go into a memory center today and you say, I'm having cognitive problems, the doctor will tell you, well, there's, you have Alzheimer's disease. Well, there's a cause. We don't know what the cause is. It's one disease. It's called Alzheimer's. 
And there's one treatment, we're going to give you a prescription for Aricept or, some, or Aducanumab or something like this. It's a monophasic approach and it's ineffective. You're going to die of Alzheimer's disease and we're not going to look for the things that are actually driving this. That is a horribly, horribly out of date approach, but it's what's being practiced virtually everywhere. The research findings show something completely different. There are dozens of contributors and initially we identified 36. We now know of a couple of more, but I just showed you some of them things like uh, like mycotoxins and things like organic toxins and things like insulin resistance and things like that. Therefore, there are six different subtypes and we'll go through those in just a second. And no surprise then, there are many personalized programs. We have to determine for each person why they have cognitive decline or why they are at risk for cognitive decline. And I hope that virtually everyone will, who's 45 years of age or older will get on active prevention because we could have a dramatic reduction in Alzheimer's disease if people would actually get on active prevention. So let's look under the hood here. Let's look at what actually causes this disease. And so here's a schematic. You can see this amyloid precursor protein right here, which is a type one membrane receptor, amino terminus out here, carboxy terminus in here. Here's the cell membrane. This is in your neurons, especially near your synapses and to a lesser extent in other cells. Now this thing is a really interesting switch. When things are good, when you have not a lot of inflammation, when you've got plenty of trophic support, hormones are optimized, nutrients are optimized, things are good, your brain says, I'm not under attack, things are good, I can build and maintain, very much like a country. So you can think of this as my brain stand. Here's your country, things are good, you're gonna grow and, and, and interact. And so APP is a master switch for this. When things are good, it gets cut at a single site and it produces these two peptides, SAPP alpha and CTF alpha. And these support the idea of making and keeping new synapses. So literally making and keeping memories. And you can trace the molecular pathways to this as an example. Estradiol, one of many examples. Estradiol binds to estrogen receptors, of course, enters the nucleus, affects hundreds of genes, and among those genes is the protease, the alpha secretase, that cuts right there. So you can see that estradiol getting an optimal level helps you to get onto this side, which is the synaptoblastic side, making new synapses. On the other hand, when things are bad, you've reduced the support, blood flow has gone down because of vascular disease, oxygenation has gone down because of sleep apnea or upper airway resistance syndrome, your mitochondrial function has declined, your nutrients are low, inflammation has made a higher demand on this. This is very much a supply demand issue. Then you go into a protective mode where you have the, you know, oral microbiome getting into your brain. Then it cuts at three sites. And the reason it does that is because this is now a protective downsizing mode. This amyloid that has been vilified in Alzheimer's and for which the drug companies have tried to develop drugs to remove it, as we saw with that patient I presented earlier, they tried to remove the amyloid, she got worse. No surprise, this was her response to these ongoing insults. And so in fact, the amyloid, the A-beta peptide itself is part of the innate immune system. So very much like, again, what's happened with the pandemic, people died of cytokine storm. In Alzheimer's disease, people are dying of cytokine drizzle. You again have a mismatch where your innate system is activated, A-beta being part of that, and it's not like cytokine storm, but it's like cytokine drizzle. And unfortunately, your adaptive system hasn't kept up. You continue to have the insult. And so you keep that innate system on. You keep making that amyloid. You keep downsizing over time. We need to figure out what's causing that, reduce the inflammation, get the adaptive system working appropriately, optimize things, and allow these people to go back to the synaptoclastic side and away from the synaptoblastic side. So your brain then responds by making these four peptides that tell your brain, go into a protective downsizing mode. So what that means is that your probability of developing Alzheimer's 
is proportional to an integral over time of all the things that are causing your synaptoclastic signaling. That's the ones that are pulling back for over all the things that are causing the synaptoblastic signal. So that doesn't tell you what test to order. The good news is it's really four major groups of things that you can test. And the good news, you can test all of them and you can address all of them therapeutically. And there are, these are the four big groups. Anything here that causes inflammation. So that's causing a bigger drag on the supply demand. That's causing your brain to work overtime and to protect itself by making that amyloid. We want to get rid of those inflammatory mediators. And more importantly, we want to determine what's causing the inflammation so that we can remove that. And in this woman's case, of course, a lot of it turned out to be the mycotoxins she was exposed to. And then second would be other toxins, things like uh, yeah, the uh, uh, inorganics. Air pollution has, has emerged as a major contributor to cognitive decline. Heavy metals. And then organics, things like toluene, benzene, things like that. And then, as I mentioned, biotoxins, things like trichothecenes and ochratoxin A and things like that. Now, in the denominator, so things that when they're going down are a problem, energetics. And that's basically four things. Blood flow, oxygenation, mitochondrial function, and ketones. You've got to have something to burn. You've got to have a substrate. And of course, we are typically burning, we have to burn one of two things in our brains, glucose, ketones. And unfortunately, as we develop cognitive decline, we lose both of those. We have insulin resistance. 80 million Americans have insulin resistance. So we're not particularly good at burning glucose. And unfortunately, we're also not keto adapted. And of course, you don't generate ketones as long as your insulin is high. So we really have an energetic emergency, which is why when I see these patients, we typically want to get them started among other things in the overall protocol. Just take some, some exogenous ketones until you can develop endogenous ketosis. And uh, Professor Stephen Kinane has shown beautifully that even ketones alone can be helpful. And interestingly, if you look at a PET scan, what do you see in a patient who is developing Alzheimer's or who has Alzheimer's? What you see is a hallmark, a signature, which is reduced glucose utilization in the temporal and parietal regions. That is the signature on an FDG PET scan for Alzheimer's. So these cells are not utilizing glucose. And what Dr. Kinane showed is that they actually can. They don't lose the ability to respond to ketones. Even though it takes a little while to be keto adapted, they can respond nicely to that. So combining those, getting these people back to insulin sensitive and back to ketosis actually helps. So they now become metabolically flexible. They can burn both. They can go back and forth. Their brains do much, much better. So energetic reduction is a critical determinant of cognitive decline. And then the last one here is trophic support. And that's three different things. That's growth factors, NGF, BDNF, things like that. That's hormones, estradiol, testosterone, pregnenolone, progesterone, those sorts of things. And then finally, it is nutrients, vitamin D being a critical one. Again, vitamin D binds to its receptor, enters the nucleus, hundreds of genes are affected. And among them, the ability to become synaptoblastic as opposed to synaptoclastic. Mm -hmm.